All right, we're going to do a, a quick sound check. Um, everyone should be able to hear me. Joyce, are we connected to you? Yes. Perfect. Okay. I think <clears throat> we should begin. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to our webinar on Running Right, the Six Elements You Should Know for Creating Breathtaking Embroidery. Uh, my name is Alice Wolf. I'm Madeira USA's Manager of Education and Publications. And today, Madeir USA will be hosting uh, Joyce Jagger. Um, just some housekeeping first before we, um, we turn it over <clears throat> to Joyce. You'll notice that there are some icons on your screen for handouts. Uh, these refer to some of the information that Joyce will be covering. They go into a little bit more detail. They're yours to download and print if you'd like. Um, there are three of them. There's one on density settings with a needle chart. There's one on how to use tension gauges and set proper tension. And there's one that Joyce sent and is sharing with us on a hooping guide that includes uh, stabilizer and needle choices. So you'll see those uh, icons for that. Um, our webinar will be recorded. So if you missed any parts or would like to review, we'll be sending you a link to view it again. <coughs> Excuse me. And please type in any questions you may have. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can um, in real time, but we will be collecting all of them. And any that we don't get to answer, we will be emailing you a link to all the answers to all the questions. Uh, please stay with us through to the end when we will be offering you a special from Madeira and from Joyce. Finally, I'd like to welcome our very special guest today. Um, from home embroiderer to professional, from multi-head operator to business planner and consultant, <clears throat> Joyce Jagger has accomplished so much in the nearly four decades that she's been in the embroidery business. In 2000, she decided to move from doing the embroidery herself to consulting with other embroiders to help them grow their own businesses and ultimately produce the highest quality embroidery. With her help, we've narrowed down embroidery production to six elements, and today she will touch on each. Joyce, welcome. Thank you so much for allowing me to do this. I feel this is a great privilege to be here. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to learn today involves these six elements, digitizing and design, thread and bobbins, needles, stabilizers, hooping, and tension. Now, either you do it yourself or you contract it out. But digitizing is where it all begins. You may begin with the stock designs or digitize it yourself. Now the first element to keep in mind is that the digitized design must suit the fabric you are embroidering. Now when you are communicating with your digitizer, there are three important components that he or she must know. What type of fabric it is going to be sewn on, what the finished size will be of the design, and is it going to be used for a cap at some point? Now, if there are any questionable areas uh, in the artwork, make sure that you point this out in your email or whatever form of communication that you have with your digitizer. Are there areas that may be filled in or will they just be an outline? Make sure that all of these instructions are perfectly clear. This will save you a lot of time and keep you from having to send it back for editing. Now, is your design suitable for the particular fabric or garment? Now, if the design has a lot of fill or detailed stitches on top of other detail, this may not work for a lightweight fabric. This also may be the same for a stretchy performance wear fabric. Many times you need to reduce the density for performance wear, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now using stock designs. Using stock designs to go along with stock lettering from your embroidery program is a great way to get started and are not in an economical way to give your customers more of a selection, especially if they do not have an existing logo. It may be a new company that is just starting. They work out great for this. Now stock designs are digitized to supposedly work with all types of fabrics, but this is not always the case. If it's a DST file, you cannot do any edits to it or you may not be able to change and you may not be able to change the size of it. You may, you have to be very careful with adding additional settings to stock designs. 
they've been digitized with the settings in them, and you cannot change them when you have a DST file. Many times they work great on a woven fabric, but will not be good enough or have enough stitches in them or the right settings to look good on a knit fabric. And I have found that with many stock designs, by adding topping to the design when you hoop it, it'll make it work out just fine for a knit. Now, how do you determine if a job cannot be done? Now, many times a customer will give you a design or a logo that looks great in screen printing, but it may not work in embroidery. If the design has a large amount of detail and the customer is determined that the logo appears the same, you have to explain to them that it is not going to work for embroidery. Many times you will have designs that were digitized for a left chest, and they are huge, but now the customer wants it embroidered on a cap and does not want to listen that it cannot be done. The design will need to be edited to make it work, or maybe the design will just not work at all. And I have a couple of samples that I will show you what I mean. Now, here on the left is an example of a design that was first digitized for a left chest. And then the customer wanted it to go on a cap, and that was impossible. The design was too tall for the cap, and it was sewing too close to the bottom. You can see at the bottom how it pushed the letters up, causing it to look like a smile there in the center of the design. Now here on the right is the design after it was altered. I had to shorten the U's, the red and the gray U's, and that was all I did. But it made all the difference in the world. I shortened the U's by a quarter of an inch. And that design then sewed out great on a cap, and the customer didn't even know that I had altered the design. He was a very happy camper with the result. Now on this next slide, I have a design called Cheshire. Here, this design runs perfectly. Now there are many tiny letters in this design, but it was digitized with all the letters connecting so that your machine is not constantly starting and stopping causing the thread to come out of the needle. Every one of those tiny letters are connected, but it is done in such a way that you do not see any connecting stitches. The design on the slide is about 25% larger than what, it, than what it actually, excuse me, the design on the slide is 20%, 25% larger than what the design actually is. And all the lettering inside of that circle, they're only three and a half millimeters high. And for these, I use a 60 weight thread and a size 9 needle so that they will stay crisp and clear. And this is very important when you have small detail on designs. Now, if this, if this design had been any smaller, I would not have been able to do it, or I would have had to have them remove some of the detail. Now, on our next slide, the Cowgirls is an example of selecting a run stitch border versus a satin stitch border. The one on the left with the run stitch border needs to be redone with the stitching going around for at least two times, and yet it does not look as neat as the satin stitch border, especially when the thread is a light color. If it was a darker color for the border, it would not look so bad. Now changing the run stitch border to a satin stitch border made the entire design look neater and of higher quality. Now, in this next slide, this is a sweatshirt and a cap with a dog on it. Now, the sweatshirt is on the left, and this was a perfect example of a design that was digitized for a sweatshirt, and it was great. However, it would not work on a cap. This design was much too large and had to be resized for a cap. Also, for a cap, the design should always be digitized from the bottom up and from the center out. Now, for the left chest, this is not the case. It usually starts in the center and runs left to right. Now, there's always exceptions to this rule, depending on the design and how many elements that you have in it. Now, on the next slide, we're going to be talking about our second element, top thread and bobbin thread. Now, these are, you have many choices, but your first choice was selecting should always be quality. You can avoid many thread breaks when you are using quality thread. 
you choose and stick with rayon or polyester. Now, stick with rayon or polyester on your machine. If you keep switching thread types, your tension changes and your machine gets very confused. Now, believe it or not, your machine gets used to a certain type of thread and you need to stick with it. Now, if harsh, if harsh laundering is a concern, then it should be, you should be using polyester thread. This is very important if you're working with children's clothing or garments that are going to be subjected to commercial laundries. Now, in my consulting business, I've gone into many facilities where they had rayon and polyester both on the machine and wonder why they were not getting the results that they're looking for. You cannot use them interchangeably and expect to get a great result on your machine. This is a real no-no and should be totally avoided. Now, go with quality thread and bobbins. Never purchase off brands of thread or bobbins that costs less money. There's one area that you get what you pay for. You end up with thread breaks, fraying thread, inconsistency in the flow of the thread through the machine, and even colors that run. Do not ever do this. You will pay dearly for it. You pay either up front for a quality product, or you will pay in the end with extra labor or an unhappy customer. Now, mag magnetic bobbins that are popular choice today. Magnetic bobbins will run longer and more consistently. Now there's two types of magnetic bobbins. You've got a magnetic core and a man magnetic sided bobbin. Most of them will run all the way to the end with the same thread tension. Now many of the cheaper bobbins, uh, cheaper paper sided bobbins, at least the ones that I have used, will change tensions about three quarters of the way through and you have to end up throwing out the rest of the bobbin or you can, or you're going to end up with a bird's nest or loose stitches. It's just not worth it. Now this is another reason why you should not choose the cheap bobbin. Joyce, um, <clears throat> a question for you uh, uh, regarding bobbins. Um, do you favor using bobbins that match the textile color or just the regular pre-wound bobbins that come in black and white? The pre-wound bobbins. Absolutely. You, you get a better consistency with your tension with the use of the pre-wound bobbins. Does that answer the question? I think so. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about thread breaks here. Now, if your thread keeps breaking, you need to check your needles. Do you, need, do you have a nick on them or is your thread path in your thread path on your machine. If your thread starts fraying, this is usually a good indication that you have a nick or a burr someplace in the needle or in the thread path or in the bobbin area. It could even be in your throat plate or the hook or inside of the hole of your throat plate. You want to keep a good eye on those. Now, specialty threads in stock, using in stock uh, designs, you can use specialty threads in many of the stock designs. You're going to have to test it to make sure that the weight of the thread that you are using works great. If it's a lighter density, it will work excellent. If it's a heavier density, then you will have to, excuse me, a heavier weight, I should say, on your thread. Then you will have to increase the size of your, dine, your design by 5 or 10%. Now, when you increase a design in a DST file, your stitch count does not change. Your stitch is spread further apart, and if you're using a heavier thread as in some of the specialty threads, it works out excellent. Now in this next slide, I'm going to show you a design that was digitized to accommodate specialty threads. Now here is a the picture of a design that was digitized and sewn for Madeira. This was on a Christmas card that I received from Adira last year, and it was absolutely beautiful. The one on the left shows that the design was sewn out in a regular 40 weight rayon thread. But look at the one on the right. This was sewn out with a matte thread with metallic threads running through it, and it just sparkled. Now our next element is needles. 
use, needles, use the needle size that is suggested by the manufacturer for your thread for best results. Use the smallest needle appropriate for less penetrations on the garment. Now, you want to use the needle, like I said, that's appropriate for your thread. Make sure that you use the size needle that is recommended. And don't try to use a 40-weight thread and a size 9 needle. Sometimes it may work, but for the most part, you need size 10 needle. Now, if there's a choice, go with the smaller needle. A size 10 will work for most fabrics. You want the smallest hole possible. Most of your machines come with a 7511 needle, and you really need to change those to a size 7010. Your detail and your small lettering will be sharper with a smaller needle. And if you're doing letters that are less than 5 millimeters, you need to use a size 9 needle and 60 weight thread. Now, that being said, Madeira has come out with an even smaller thread, a size 75 and a size 8 needle that is dynamite for tiny letters like you see on the inside of many of the civil service organization logos such as inside the seals on the state or federal logos. Those are always very, very tiny. Joyce, if I can interrupt with another question um, about uh -huh. the specialty thread. Uh, you had mentioned that um, switching back and forth between rayon and poly can confuse a machine, and this person wrote in asking if switching specialty threads um, on a stock design would also confuse the machine. Well, you just absolutely need to, to check your tension to make sure that it's going to work. That's all. That's the only difference. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, always use sharp needles on your woven garments. And I have found that many people do not know the difference between knit garments and woven garments, so I created some charts with pictures showing you uh, the difference. This is going to be very helpful to you and your uh, employees. And there's a link in the side in the, uh, on the screen for you to download them. And you will also be getting a link in an email. Now, there's one exception to the rule of woven fabrics. Satins should be done with a ballpoint needle. If you do not use a sharp needle on satins, it could cause it to run. Now, you want to use ballpoint needles on your knits, always, always. On the fabric guides that I send you, I have listed right on the fabric guide which needle and which back to use. On one of my consulting jobs in a large company, they were complaining about how bad their caps were running. And they were actually using ballpoint needles on these caps. And they were using ballpoint needles for everything they did. And their work was far from high quality. Now, if you make the mistake of using ballpoint needles on a woven fabric, such as a cap, it can look like it was chewed up after it was embroidered. It does not give the smooth embroidery on a woven like a sharp needle does. And you can see on the left of the screen here two excellent drawings showing you the difference between a knit fabric and a woven fabric. The knit is a very unstable fabric, while the wovens, most of them are very stable. Now on this next slide, is an example of an embroidery that was done on a t-shirt knit. That This was done with a sharp needle. And when I examined the piece and checked the needle, I found out that it was also dull. And that's what caused the loops at the top of the H. Now, worn or wrong needles can create holes in the fabric. And on knits, it can create runs. You need to be careful with this. Sometimes. You can get away with a sharp needle on a knit, such as a bouquet, if you are using 7010 needles and they are new needles. It is strongly recommended that you change your needles if you are working with knits, especially with performance wear knits. You can count on holes in your fabrics if you do not switch the ball points on these types of fabrics. This can have a huge effect on your design. Now, Yes. Sorry, a quick question again. Uh, someone wrote in, what do you mean by it will run? Um, if you use a wrong needle on a, on a knit, could you describe that? Well, a knit is a knit. I mean, it's not a woven fabric, and 
if you use a ballpoint needle, a ballpoint needle punches a hole in it, and it can cause it to run. It can, just as if you were knitting a design and you had uh, cut the thread, it can cause it to, to run. That's what I mean. And the running, people remember nylon stockings or pantyhose. Oh, that, <laughs> that's if yeah. you get a run in it, that's what a run would be, and that's what you you run the risk of causing into uh, your knit fabric. Uh, just like stockings, that's what somebody wrote in. Um, Joyce, okay. also, that what type needle do you recommend for caps? I re I recommend uh, well start out with a seventy ten sharp. Okay. And if that, if that isn't uh, big enough and go to a 7511. But for all of my caps, I use the 7010 sharps even on my flex fit caps. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of quality, do you see the dot that is connected to the bottom of the eye here on this word where it says housekeeping? This is a real no no when it comes to paying attention to detail and showing that you are creating a quality product. You always want to disconnect that dot on that eye. Now on our next slide, we have a chart for needles. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> now in this chart, it's showing you what needles you should be using with the different types of thread. Um, and on our next slide, we're talking about our elements of stabilizers. Stabilizers, both backing and topping, can keep a design and registration and also keeps the garment from puckering. Very, very important. Using the correct backings or stabilizers is, is extremely important in stabilizing your design on your garment. If you are using the wrong backing or a cheap backing, your design can rip right through. And it does not sew out very good. It becomes very distorted, especially after it has been laundered. Now, always use tearaway backing on woven's. Do not ever use a cutaway backing on a woven fabric. If you use a cutaway backing on a woven fabric, you can, it can cause puckering. I have gone into large companies and the puckering around the design was their biggest complaint. Now, many of these large companies use only one backing and that is usually a heavy cutaway. They think that they need to have that stability, especially if you have a lot of fill stitches. And this simply is not true. I had a contract job for a long time that was 135,000 stitches with a lot of fill that we did on the back of cotton woven shirts. And there were there was no pull or puffing at all in them. I used a heavy three ounce tearaway backing on them and they came out great. And this is the same backing that I use on all of my caps. Now always use cutaway on knits and make sure that you're using a cutaway on your knits. Absolutely. You have different weights of knits, so you're going to have different types of cutaway backing for these. But still, always use cutaway on them. Now, that being said, I have found that the perfect recipe for the knits, such as a lightweight knit, is two layers of no-show web line backing and one layer of crisp one and a half ounce tearaway. Now, what the tearaway does is it holds it flat and keeps the small lettering crisp, and also the tiny detail shows up more. And on the performance wear, Madeira has a very lightweight woven backing called performance that works out great for any type of this situation. It gives the performance wear more stability and it helps to control the stretch in the very stretchy performance wear. And this extra layer of crisp tearaway added to this, again, helps the tiny letter on the shirts using the woven backing as well. I'm sorry, I just want to interrupt very briefly to um, answer one question. A fabric that has nap, is any fabric that has uh, texture to it, like a fleece or a terry cloth, it has um, height to it. And I'm, I'm interrupting here because I know that Joyce will be refer, referring to it again for some other reasons later on, but um, it's a corduroy, fleece, terry cloth, any fabric that has height to it. Thank you, sorry. 
Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, now, on heavy knits, like sweatshirt fabric and fleece, you always use two layers of the two ounce cutaway. Now, stick on backing for small items. This, this is great for hard to hoop or impossible to hoop items. And I have used it very successfully on the sides of visors. And they are impossible to hoop, but the stick on backing works great for them. It also works great on dog collars, belts, straps, shirt cuffs, and any other type of item that is hard or impossible to hoop. Now I want to talk a little bit about topping and the importance of using topping on some of your fabrics. Topping increases the visibility of stitches on fabrics with a nap, such as a fleece or a terry. Now, I use topping on all my knits. It really does make a difference in your finished product. It keeps the thread on top of the fabric, and it also lubricates the needle in helping it to glide through the fabric easier with less issues. Now, topping used on is used on all fabrics with nap. You always use a topping on all fabrics that have any type of nap, such as a terry cloth. And it also needs to be used on fleece and works great on any type of fabric that has a rough texture, like you were saying with a corduroy. I've even used it on caps that have a heavy texture and on caps that have been made from the knit mesh fabric. Now on our next slide, these are some samples of sticky back that uh, products have been used with sticky backing. In the garment, excuse me, in the picture on the left, this is a the bottom edge of a curtain that was done with the sticky backing. And you can see how nice and flat it holds it as it embroidered those sport symbols. And the one on the right is a cuff that was done with the stick on backing. And it works out great for this type of situation. Now on our next slide, the picture on the left, the first picture, this is showing a design that was done on a performance wear knit, and there are several things wrong with this. But the main thing is it was used with the wrong backing, it causing it to pull up and pucker. It also had too many stitches, no pull compensation, and no wrong, and, and it had the wrong underlay. Now the one, the design on the right is one that I edited, and it had two layers of no-show backing along with the layer of one and a half ounce crisp tearaway and that one came out much much better and like I had said before Madeira has a backing that is specially created for performance wear and it works out excellent. Joyce, now, uh, in this sorry yeah, go ahead. just before you go to the next one um, a couple of things that one person wrote in um, that if they had a dime for every time they heard if you wear it, don't tear it, and is asking what your input is on that saying. I've never heard it before. Oh, I've heard it many, many times. Okay. <laughs> You're the right yes. one to ask them. Yes, and it is so wrong, and I think that comes out of the home industry. I'm not sure, uh, but that is, it's wrong. You want to always use woven, excuse me, you want to use tear away on woven garments, and cut away on knits. Yes, absolutely. You're going to get a much better result when you use the uh, tear away on woven garments. And one other person asked about using um, the stick on backing. Is that a problem on the machine and the needle, the adhesive that's on it? Well, with the, the needle, very often you have to stop and take a piece of uh, a cotton ball and put alcohol on it and run it down the needle. And that takes the, takes the sticky right off. Okay. Because you will have some issues. Uh, and before we go any farther, also, another thing that works great that I don't have in my notes or anything is when you, when you have a design that no matter what you do, like it's uh, one that's got rainproofing on the back of it, or excuse me, on the front of the fabric. That's a perfect example. And it keeps wanting to skip stitches. If you'll take a piece of wax paper and slide it under your hoop, 
that will take care of that problem. Just a little tidbit. Okay, on this picture right here, you can see how awful this looks. Um, this was done, this was a white t-shirt that was done with just regular cutaway thread, excuse me, regular cutaway backing. And it just looks like a patch or a badge on the back of the fabric, and it's, it's awful. If that had been done with the no-show backing, you could hardly detect it. So this is huge when you're trying to service your customers with high-quality work. So please, please remember that. Now, in our next picture, this is a lightweight fleece that needed topping something fierce. You'll see in the picture on the left that parts of the design just sort of sink into the fabric. And yet the one on the right, this is a huge difference. They both stand right up on the top of the fabric. And you can see all of the design, not just parts of it. Huge difference. Now, in our, on our next slide, we're going to be talking about hooping. Hooping should be taut, not loose, in order to hold the item perfectly while it is being embroidered. There should be no puckers or loose areas at all within the hoop. And the performance wear demands special attention. These slippery, stretchy fabrics need to be hooped very tight, but you must be careful not to stretch them. And if you do, they will surely pucker. Now, magnetic hoops, they solve many, many issues. Magnetic hoops are used for very thick, difficult to hoop items, especially for items like uh, Carhartt jackets or bags. And the magnetic hoops hold the items tighter than the clamps that have been so popular for the past few years. These magnetic hoops are fantastic, my own personal opinion. And on this next slide, we have a sample of a standard hoop that was hooped correctly and a magnetic hoop. And you, in the magnetic hoop, you can see how tight that fabric is and how it holds that just perfect. And the one on the left is a standard hoop. And again, you don't see any pulls or puckers or loose areas in that hoop. And that is the way that it should be hooped. That is perfect. Joyce, have you heard um, in your travels anything about magnetic hoops uh, damaging the computers on these machines? No. I've never heard of that, anything like that. Uh-uh. Okay. Not to my knowledge. Is that something that, that you have heard? Uh, no, it was a question that just came in, so I just wanted to put their mind at rest. <laughs> I've never heard of that. No, absolutely never heard of that. And I go into very, very large companies that that's all they use. They've got multi-head machines, and they that's all they use is magnetic hoops. So I, I think I would have heard about it. Right, and we have some people that are writing in saying, I use magnetic hoops and there's no problems. So um, right. I think it's an urban myth and not true that um, using magnetic hoops with, will hurt the computer part of the machine or the bobbins. Yeah, yeah they aren't. The, the people that came up with these magnetic hoops are have been embroiders for years, and they know what they're doing. So, okay, element number six. Now, always take time to set the upper and lower thread tension before beginning a new design. And you need a top tension gauge and a bottom or bobbin tension gauge. Absolutely for each, you know, this, these are must-haves and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But before I do, I want to tell you a little story about using these tension gauges. I had to teach some classes for Hirsch, the Tejima distributors, and they wanted me to teach the students how to use the tension gauges and I absolutely had a fit. I had been testing my tensions uh, by hand for over 30 years and using the fuel method, and I felt that that was adequate, and I was very familiar with that um, method, and that's what I wanted to teach. But they would not listen to me, and they insisted that I use the gauges. After all, they were selling them. Well, that was something that I had to learn before I could teach it, and I spent quite a bit of time trying to figure it out before the class, and I frankly was very nervous. There was no one there to show me how to use them, and what if I messed it up or it didn't do it right? Well, I got through that little session and 
when I finished and went home, I took the tension gauges with me, and I decided to use them on my own machine to see if they really did make a difference. And I was shocked. I could not believe how much better my t machines ran. They eliminated thread breaks, thread fraying, and my tension stayed better when I used the thread tensions. <clears throat> Joyce, I, I'm going to just interrupt again. I apologize. Um, we're a little bit halfway through our webinar now, and I think um, some people are concerned that their questions might not be answered uh, by you right now. I just want to assure everyone that we are collecting every single question that comes in. They're not wasted. They're not disappearing. Uh, we will be answering them all and then sending everyone a link to look at these questions and answers. So please don't think if you type in a question that it's being wasted. It's not. You'll get your answer. Thank you. Very good. Okay. I'll try to hurry a little bit, too, so we can get more answered. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing uh, fine. <laughs> now, the picture on the left here is the top tension gauge. Now, you want to wrap the, the, the rayon or polyester thread around it and pull it straight towards you, and the proper measurement for the rayon thread should be about 100 to 120 grams. Now, this all depends on your machine. Each machine has its own personality, and you want to remember that. But if you have it set correctly, and I will show you on another screen, your tension is set correctly, then your design will sew up perfectly, and you'll have no thread breaks. Now, if you're using polyester thread, you're going to need to have a higher tension which is about 130 to 150, and either one of these thread, either one of these threads will sew out great as long as you have the top and the bobbin tension set correctly. Now, there's a misconception out there that the rayon thread breaks easier, and you'll have more thread breaks with rayon than you do with polyester, and this simply is not true. If you have your tension set correctly, and your design is done properly along with your hooping done correctly, it will sew out perfect with rayon or polyester. I just wanted to clear that up about the rayon thread breaking easier because it just isn't true. Now, um, on the right is our bobbin tension gauge. Now, here in this picture, this is a, that's okay, you can go to the next one. Here is a picture of showing you tensions being how they should set, be, excuse me, how they should be set. Now, the one on the very left, you can see there is no bobbin thread showing at all, and that is way too loose, way, way too loose. The one in the center, your top tension is too tight. So you have to loosen that or you have to tighten your bobbin thread, one or the other. And sometimes you have to just kind of play around to figure out which is it. However, you don't need to play around if you use your bobbin tension gauge. Okay? Remember that. Now, the one on the right is just perfect. You need one-third top thread, one-third bottom thread, and one-third top thread. And when you've got that, your tension is perfect. So, now, troubleshooting. When faced with an issue such as puckering or your design is not staying in registration or you're getting thread breaks, your design is being distorted or your fabric has been damaged or your embroidery just does not look as good as it should, there's often a very common solution. Now, in our next slide, I'm going to show you puckering. Now, Puckering can be avoided when your design is digitized properly and you are using the right backing and your garment is hooped properly. Now, this design was digitized for a knit and yet it was used on a woven fabric. It has been hooped with the wrong backing. You always want to test your design out on the same type of fabric that you are going to be using for your finished product. Now, my perfect backing recipe for a woven fabric is two layers of one and a half ounce crisp tearaway backing or stabilizer. Now, never hoop more than two pieces in your hoop at one time of the tearaway backing. And if you see a slight pucker and you have your garment hoop tight, take another layer of the one and a half ounce crisp tearaway, fold it in half, and slide it underneath the hoop before you start sewing. This will prevent it from puckering. And it just holds it flat. 
I was working with a very large company that had this issue on lightweight, stretchy shirts. And it was so bad that the salespeople decided that they were not going to sell those items any longer until they got someone in to help your operators with this problem. So they called me to solve their problem, and this is the solution that I came up with, and it worked out great. So remember that. If it, if it looks like it's going to pucker to begin with, take an extra piece of the crisp tearaway, fold it in half, slide it under the hoop, and you'd be amazed what it does. I've been doing this ever since I came up with that solution. Now on our next slide, this Indian head was done on a very stretchy performance wear, and it's the same design that had been used for years on a bunch of other garments, uh, any other type of garments, but this time the customer wanted performance wear. And it was done with a lot of heavy density, and you can see what happened. Now, again, it worked fine on other types of fabrics, but not on this one. And the fill stitches were pushing to the left, and the border just did not match up at all. Now, you can see that it still has topping on it in my picture here. And if topping had not been used, it would have been worse. And after about 20% of the density was removed from this design, it sewed out great on this performance wear. So that's just another tidbit about performance wear. The design densities need to be a little bit lighter than they do on your other knit fabrics. Trace, when you're combining two, um, two pieces of, of backing, whether they're the same or not, uh, do you recommend turning one? Uh, someone asked about a quarter turn, or do you think that's necessary or no? If you have a good backing, it's not necessary. If you have a cheap backing, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. absolutely. Because on a good backing, it's more even. On the cheap backings, they're not. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep, it sure does. I mean, that's the fact. So if you've got cheap backing, throw it out and get new ones. Okay. Just a another little tidbit. All right. Now, in this one, this design had a lot of fill stitches, and it was pushing down. And you can see the one on the, on the left. It had a run stitch border at the bottom, and it just did not cover it. The, run, the fill stitches just pushed right down below the uh, run stitches. So I added a satin stitch, and it covered it up nicely, and it made the design look like a much higher quality design. You've got to be very careful with that uh, when you're designing your when you're designing your embroideries or you're having them digitize either one every one of these fill stitches were going in the all in the same direction and that's wrong they need to go in different directions I've got another just a little tidbit there okay but by adding that satin stitch that helped to uh, save that design okay in our next slide, here is a collection of must-have items that will help prevent thread breaks when the tensions are set correctly. The, the machine must be oiled properly, the right needles must be used, and make sure that you are oiling your hook area every four hours of machine operation. This little pin oiler that is right there above the tension gauge is your best oiler, oiler to use. It only dispenses one drop of oil, and you're not going to be getting oil all over your garments. It is perfect. Now, on our next slide, here's an example of lettering that was very simple and easy to do, but if it is not done correctly, it will ruin the effect of the job, and you surely will not show up in high quality. Now, the first one is just stock lettering, uh, just as someone typed it out in their software, and I see this so often. A new embroiderer thinks that all they have to do is select the lettering style that they want, type it out, and send it to the machine, and this is the result. They don't even know that it is not correct. The second one is it has pull comp and underlay settings that were added for the proper garment, and the dot was removed from the uh, top of the eye. Now in the third one, this is exactly the same design, and the only difference here is I added topping to it. 
so you can see what happens when you have the correct settings and you add topping it's all the makes all the difference in the world and you can end up with a high quality embroidery now Joyce, on our next Joyce, okay, I'm sorry um, just another question um, could you talk a little bit about removing the topping um, you, you mentioned a couple times about the value of using it and a question came in about uh, the proper way to remove it especially um, in between little teeny tiny letters okay as far as I'm concerned there's only one way to remove it you take you make a take all your scraps of topping and you make a ball out of it okay and you need a steamer don't be spraying I mean yeah a lot of people tell you you just spritz it with water and it'll all melt well it does and it leaves a glob and it's it's not the correct way to do it you take a steamer and you take your scraps of, of salvi or topping and you wad them together and put your wand over the top of them and you just keep squeezing together until you have a nice ball okay set it aside let it dry out a little bit now you take your your uh, garment and you pull off the topping that you can and I just quickly you don't have to go and pick at it at all and then steam it take the the wand of the steamer and run it over the edge of the hoop the take removing the hoop mark first and then run it over the edge of the embroidery just keep, keep it down close to the embroidery until it steams good then take your ball and just tap it on that embroidery and it pulls it right out everything right out between all your little letters and everything you may have to do it a couple times but I mean it works out great and your garments not wet and it's ready to be packaged that is the right way to do it we refer to that as the bubble gum method because it's like when you used to be a little kid and blow a bubble and it was on your mouth and your face if you watered it up mm -hmm. and dabbed that it, it all was collected collected. Yep. Another question before we leave this slide. Uh, someone is asking if you look at the word embroidery, how would mm -hmm. how would you eliminate that stitch between the dot on the eye and the body of the eye? Uh, you have to do that with your software. It depends on what software you've got. Okay. So that is not a question I can answer. <laughs> First of all, you have to you have to take your design and you break it apart. And um, or uh, put it in the wireframe or whatever it depends on your software and you just separate that dot from the eye and you take the dot and you move it to the, so that the dot sews last oh. okay okay so and in some softwares that's all you have to do but make sure you add a lock stitch to the dot beginning beginning lock stitch and end lock stitch Okay, now on our next slide, here's a sample explaining push and pull for those that do not understand what I mean when I say pull comp. It's actually pull compensation. Now, these are two stock lettering H's, but the principle works the same on each one or on any type of object in your design. You've got stitch points or pull-in or penetration points on your lettering or your segment, and you have a expansion are push points which are on the open ends and they're on the opposite side of the penetration points. Now you must bring in those areas or cut them short. This is called push compensation. Now it does not matter if you're working with a letter or, or a shape. It is true for all um, different shapes and it also is true for angles of your shapes. Now next month in my free embroidery training. I have one the last Thursday of every month. I'm going to be talking about push and pull compensation. So uh, you might want to look out for that because that will be very informative for you. Now on our next slide, this is the design, again this is much larger on the screen than it actually was. This was sewn on a heavy ribbed polyester necktie. Now the small letters that are, were all tied together but you can see that the M on the uh, in the last M on team does not look good. Now this this hit a place in the rib and it distorted it. Now this was my practice sew out, and on the actual neckties we used topping, and it prevented that from happening. This helps it to step over the rib in the fabric, and 
also the lock knot that is on the outside edge of the run stitch going around the design. That dot or that lock stitch was moved up to the top of the T and it was hardly detected. Now, did you have a question? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. On our next slide, this is damaged fabric caused by bird nesting. Now, bird nesting can not only ruin the design, but most of the time it will ruin the garment. And this is usually a tension problem, or it could also be indicative of a dry hook. Now, the bobbin and the hook area of the machine needs to be oiled every four hours of running time. And I want to tell you a little story here. Last week, one of my students called and wanted and was having issues with thread, with bird nesting. He had his tension set right, and he had changed his needles. And, and he had everything done right. Um, he was talking to my son, who is one of our coaches, and asked him if he had oiled the hook on the machine that day. And he said, what? He was not even aware of the fact that he was supposed to do this. This is huge. If the hook dries out, it can surely call, cause bird nests. The thread gets caught, and it just keeps getting worse. Oiling that machine every four hours of running time is extremely important and will prevent many issues in production. Joyce, would you recommend using topping on caps? On caps that have a heavy rib knit, uh, excuse me, have a heavy rib on them, or the knit caps, yes. And what about baseball type caps? Does it help in the center seam dealing with that or no? No, not really. Okay. In the center, in the center seam, when you when you're working with caps, your the best little trick is to walk your machine right at the beginning of it to, to get it over that center part. And what I mean by walking your machine is you hold your finger against the start button and just let it creep one stitch at a time for about 12 stitches until it gets past that point, and that will prevent that from happening. It goes right over that seam, and it works out great. Now, we have covered digitizing and design, threads and bobbin, uh, needles, stabilizers, hooping, and tension. And if you have a good understanding of each one of these items, it can turn out a great, high-quality product and that is so important in today's world. There is so much mediocre embroidery being done, and I am sure that you want to be one of those embroiders that are doing only high-quality embroidery and making all of your designs run right. Joyce, uh, we want to thank you for all of the knowledge um, that you're sharing with us today. Um, and I want to uh, direct everybody's attention to this last slide uh, to thank all of our attendees for their time. Um, you'll see here that there are two specials. Uh, one is a savings from Madeira USA on your next order, and an offer from Joyce, which she, one of which she mentioned earlier. Uh, this one is for free participation in one of her trainings about another very, very popular subject for embroiderers, which is pricing. Uh, again, for everyone that's, that's still with us, we will be sending you our collection of questions and answers. So if you sent in a question, expect to get that back um, as part of several page, pages worth of questions and answers. We'll also be sending you a link, an electronic link, that will take you to Joyce's website for more information about the training that you can get directly from her, and a link to our special. Um, Joyce, do you have anything to add to that that people might need to know in order to find you? Uh, no, just go to TheEmbroideryCoach.com, and if they click on, there's a little tab at the top, and it says free. If they click on that, that'll take them right to that um, page to sign up for that free training. It's, it's, it's going to be an excellent training, so you don't want to miss it. It's a great opportunity to, to hear more about uh, what Joyce has to share. Um, please contact Madeira USA or Joyce Jagger if you have any further concerns about producing quality embroidery. Um, that was the goal of this webinar today for Joyce to share with all of us um, the ways, the six elements that will ensure your production of quality embroidery. Thank you so much for staying with us. And um, 
I would like to thank everyone for being with us. Thank you. And goodbye. I thank you too. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>